Thank you, Christy, and uh, welcome everyone to this episode of Cup of Joe. It's always great to see so many uh, familiar faces. I'm always uh, a little um, surprised at how impactful this medium is, but it really does work. I mean, short of being able to be in the same room and hug each other, it really is a good way to reconnect. So thank you all so much for showing up. I really appreciate it. What an honor it is to get to spend some time with such a stellar vandal. Mm -hmm. uh, Governor Dirk Kempthorn, of course, is our guest today. And I'm gonna share a little bit more about his career in just a moment. Um, but I also wanted to be sure and introduce, I'm not sure if she's on yet, but um, former First Lady uh, Patricia Kempthorne, is she with us today um, yet? Maybe she hasn't had a chance to sign in. But she's another stellar vandal and um, just want to thank her for ongoing impact that she's had on um, Idaho over the years in general, but also the work that she's done with cancer survivors and cancer um, research has just been amazing. Um, it's important and work and appreciated. So thanks to, um, thanks to Patricia for all that she's done for our great state. So Dirk Kempthorne has served as an elected public servant for the majority of his esteemed career. And many of us know a lot of that background, but here's some details. I like to think it all began when he was elected student body president at the <laughs> University of Idaho right. in the 1970s. Um, he served seven years as the mayor of Boise. He was elected to the U.S. Senate in November of 1992. Six years later, he was elected governor of Idaho and then was reelected in 2002. He's a uh, uh, past chair of the Western Governors Association, past president of the Council of State Governments, and chaired the Public Policy Committee of the Republican Governors Association. He stepped down as governor in May 2006, but that's only because he was being sworn in as a U.S. Secretary of the <laughs> Interior um, under President George W. Bush, and there he served until 2009. Um, Throughout his professional career, he has remained an enthusiastic and true blue vandal. Um, he, just last year, he was awarded an honorary doctorate from our alma mater. And I will even tell that he has been writing cards to members of the class of 2020, congratulating them on their, uh, on their achievements. So thank you for all of that and, and welcome, Governor Kempthorne. Yes. Kathy, thank you so much. I am, and I appreciate you mentioning Patricia. Um, in fact, all of her efforts there with regard to uh, cancer and detection and prevention, um, they're at Gritman Hospital. They've named that particular health facility after her, which I think is a tremendous honor. Uh, something I'm proud of, and I know she is proud of you. Every year you have the, the pink tea, we have yeah, the pink tea, and now we added the pink cocktail. So yeah, yeah I think you get a thousand people there in Moscow. I think it's just magnificent. Um, I was an orderly at Gritman Hospital, working my way through school. I'm one of the few students that probably stayed in Moscow during the summer months. I, I just I love the Palouse. I love Moscow, and so again, I was I worked graveyard at Gritman Hospital. Oh There's nothing named for me at Gritman. There, for Patricia, there is. <laughs> um, but um, it, was, it was wonderful. And then Patricia and I, even though both of us had individually moved back to Boise, when I asked her if she would marry me, and we met at the University of Idaho, mm -hmm. but we went back up to Moscow and on top of Moscow Mountain on September 18th at sunrise, Eric Callas of the Methodist Church performed the service. Oh, you can't get more vandal than that. That's yeah, lovely. Yeah. What a great, great, great story. Yeah. Oh, I want to start with a little bit of a check-in. How are you and yours doing with quarantine and pandemic? Everything good on that front? Yeah, it is. I mean, uh, Patricia and I are blessed with five beautiful grandchildren. Mm -hmm. um, and Heather and Drew, our daughter, and Drew have three grand or sons here, three of our grandsons. And then uh, Jeff and Natasha, our son and daughter-in-law, have two beautiful children in Idaho. So Patricia and I, when COVID began, we had to make a decision. How do we provide support to both networks of the family? So I flew back east. So I'm, I'm here to help Heather with the boys in Virginia. Uh, I've bought a ticket now to come back to Idaho next month. But I, I'll give you an idea, Kathy. I mean, you probably all experienced this. 
but early on during COVID, when we're all having to distance, et cetera, uh, our little grandson, Jake, turned 10, called me in the morning. Grandpa, will you come to my birthday party tonight? And I said, of course I will. I'll be there, Jake. And then a little while later, Heather had to call and say, Dad, I'm just not sure it's a good idea yet. And so I took the presents over. I put them on the front step, the porch. And then I went and stood on the sidewalk while Jake opened them. So, oh. Yeah. Too many stories like that. I think you're right. Yeah. All of us have impacted that, been impacted that way. But we'll and, get through it. Yeah, we will. We will. Uh, you know, and they get closer and closer to some solutions here, it seems like, every day. Um, so, like a lot of us, um, Governor, you weren't a native Idahoan. How did you find and choose the University of Idaho? My childhood was in Spokane, Washington. Okay. Um, so, really, I, my fond memories of the Northwest. And then uh, after graduation, the graduation gift my dad gave me was to say, all right, let's go look at the campuses you're interested in. Yes. I went to Moscow. I didn't know a soul, mm -hmm. but I absolutely fell in love with it. I just fell in love with it, fell in love with the Palouse. And um, that's how it all started. I, I will also add to that. I was an independent. Um, I lived in Wallace Complex and I had uh, the western side of the building so that we could see the sunsets when you look out over the oh, farm. Oh, yes. Yep. i tell you, um, the Palouse has some of those magnificent sunsets I've ever seen. And I always appreciate that all of my buddies that lived in Whitman Hall, we'd all go upstairs and go into the rooms that looked out on the sunset and enjoy them. It, it was oh, really great. Nice. I was in Wallace, too. I was in Wholesome Olson Hall. So we have that in common. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. Have that in common. Yep. Um, you were so active in so many things when you were in school, um, especially student government. How did you get into that? I know you were a political science major, but what, what attracted you to um, student government and how did that prepare you for what you ended up doing for your whole career? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I got into it first by being elected the dormitory president at Whitman Hall. Really? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Yeah, and then I just kind of continued to be active. I mean, I, I went to the University of Idaho to become a doctor, a medical, a medical doctor. Yes. Wow. Okay. I did not do well in chemistry and physics, to be honest with you. <laughs> and that's why I just feel it was so beautiful and it was a full circle to come back, as you say, last year and receive a doctorate at the University of Idaho. There you go. Type of doctorate. Um, but I ran for student body president. Um, Patricia was head of Panhellenic, and I don't even know all these Greek terms because I was independent. But um, my opponents, Rod Grammer, Jeff Stoddard, all I can tell you is <laughs> Patricia did not vote for me. Um, but anyway, we, we, everything's fine now. Good. I'm glad you smoothed that over. Goodness yeah. sake. <laughs> Were you active in uh, issue government before you decided to run for president? Not really. Wow, that's amazing. You know, usually it's a progression. So who's your running mate? Well, you really didn't have a running mate. But I will tell you that the, the, the gentleman that was elected the vice president was Rick Smith. Okay. He was Greek. Okay. And again, we didn't know each other at the outset. But one day he said to me, Dirk, damn it, I'm your vice president. You got to, you got to work with me. And I really appreciated him <laughs> saying that because mm -hmm. we then became very good friends and he was an outstanding vice president. And I think it was something that stuck with me later on in life with, which we may talk about later, but that is sometimes you got to be bipartisan. You got to reach across the aisle, whether it's independent Greek, Republican, Democrat, whatever the case may be. But um, anyway, I, I just have wonderful memories of student government. Mm -hmm. I can tell you, um, Christy, that one picture that you showed of Kibbe Dome. Yes. We did that. Um, I was the president. I went to every living group, and there were over 50. Yes. And I would meet with, all, during the living group government, and I'd, I'd tell them, 
here's what we're trying to do. We could put a dome on that. We've all sat through the frigid Palouse winters. Yes. This could really do some great things. If we do this, though, we will make as one of the requirements that the students are absolutely at the part of the governing of yeah. that you know. And so uh, I'll tell you what, it was very strong support. I flew down to Twin Falls and I made the presentation of the Board of Regents uh -huh. and Butch Alford, the publisher of the Lucian Tribune, who was a member of the region, said, this is really unusual. We've never had students come forward and ask for a self-assessment. And we said, well, uh -huh. we're doing it this time. We believe it's gonna be a tremendous structure it will be a, a real asset for the university. But again, students have to be part of the governing of that facility. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's so, great. So many lessons, it seemed like, in student government that you carried with you throughout the, your, your whole career. Um, who's your favorite, prof who were your favorite professors when you were on campus? There, I mean, there's some iconic ones that come to mind, but who, who most influenced what you, uh, how you worked? Well, once I transferred to political science, my advisor was Sidney Duncan. Oh. Uh, <clears throat> Sid Duncan was magnificent. Um, he was unorthodox in his approach because in his classrooms, rather than lecturing or having us read the stuff and then go in the next day and talk about it, he would have, uh, he would have us role play. And in one of the, the courses I took, uh, which was called Iron City. It was about government. Right. But he utilized his experience as, as having been the former New York boxing commissioner and also head of Department of Financial Management for the state of Idaho. So he incorporated all of his past. But in that Iron City scenario, uh, ironically, he chose me to be the mayor. <laughs> and then he chose another buddy of mine, to be the irascible rancher, which was Brad Little. <laughs> and, uh, typecasting. Typecasting, yeah, absolutely. I love so anyway, it. <laughs> it's kind of fun to look back and see that. Um, sorry. Can you hear that? Yeah, we can. Sorry. That's right. The Marine Radio. So, um, but I remember I'd go out to Spring Valley Reservoir. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. I'd see Dr. Duncan there. Mm -hmm. And he was so great. Dirk, Dirk, come here. I want to show you how to catch these fish. And boy, he taught me some pretty good stuff. I mean, that, that's the sort of, I don't know, professor you want, somebody who cares about you. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, in, I'm would go up there by the administration building when it would be one of those beautiful nights of stars. And Cliff Dobler would be sitting up at the top of those stairs of the old administration building. Right. And he'd point out to me the different constellations, what they meant. Um, I had some wonderful professors, I really did. It's kind of a, uh, what we all, one thing, one thing among many that all vandals have in common. We've oh, all yeah. had. Sig Rowland. Yes. You know, remember oh, I mean, we could go on and on and talk about them. Yeah. yeah. I, I must say this though, fast forward, and then for whatever reason, I'm elected governor. And oh, there are I many went, reasons. <laughs> I went to the commencement address, and the different colleges had to come in and acknowledge and introduce the college to the governor. And seated down there with the robes were a variety of professors I had had that were still teaching. Yeah. And some of them wondered why in the world I was up there. <laughs> I know you love the Moscow campus. Mm -hmm. um, and you've spent a lot of time here. You mentioned the stairs to the old administration building. Yeah. What are some of the other, pla other places on campus that really were your places? Well, like I say, I, I would wander out to the farm often. Mm -hmm. I'd go out there by myself. Um, I took a course called Voice Diction and Oral Interpretation. Oh, uh-huh. And I'd go out there where you'd find the a number of cows yes, and they'd be grazing and I'd go and I'd give them a speech, <laughs> you know, and they'd all come up to the fence. Um, I did pretty good in that class. <laughs> um, I remember, oh yeah, I think it used to be called the UCC, University Classroom Center. Right. Now it's the Learning Center. 
teaching TLC. and learning center. Yeah, TLC. Yeah. Teaching and learning center. And I'll tell you what, I was there when it was absolutely, during the plus winter, you froze in those classrooms. Yes. The, the, and so that's something I wanted to take care of. That's why when we had that terrible downturn of the economy, I said, we're not going to be victims of this. We're going to write our own history. Mm -hmm. and be, you know, victorious of this. So we put a major facility at every college first campus, and the TLC is what we put in during that one. Um, and then, uh, like I said, I'd, I'd go out to Moscow Mountain. I'd wander those hills a lot. But just to walk the campus, I always loved it. Yep. Yep. For me, the camp the Newman building. Yep. Camper Down Elms, all yep. one of my all will always be one of my favorite. And those steps in the admin building that look like marble because you can feel where the other students yep. have walked before yep. you. I'll tell you one other thing that happened and, and how it, it had an effect on me. So I mentioned Rick Smith. Yes. HY vice president. Mm -hmm. And Bill Fay was a member of the HY Senate. So Rick, Bill, and I went down there. We took the student government car, drove to Boise to lobby on behalf of the University of Idaho. Mm -hmm. um, and, I mean, we, we really took it serious. And so anyway, we're headed back. It's, it's a terrible winter night. It's late. We're all tired. I was not driving. But um, we hit something and the car flipped and it began rolling three or four times, maybe five. Had it not been for that large snow bank right there outside of banks, oh, we had gone yeah. into the river. We ended up mm. you know, with the roof on the pavement, our stuff was scattered everywhere. We were so fortunate to walk away from it. But when I became governor, I said, that's something we have to correct because there were so many bad highways and, and unsafe conditions for so many students yep. trying to get home during the holidays or coming back. Yep. And so we did a major, major road program that ended up, I think just last year, 53 different projects. Amazing. Idaho Transportation Department and Idaho State Police affirm that the safety measures, the straightening of the roads that we put in, save at least 88 lives a year in Idaho, and many of those are the students. Yes, yes, many, many. Yeah. Um, one project that uh, campus is changing a little bit, tomorrow they're placing the big central beam on the new arena. Oh, and okay. I know when you were here for the Hall of Fame, yep. uh, and you first learned of the project, or not Hall of Fame, honorary doctorate, and you first learned about the project, you're the one that said, if you're going to build it, it better be stunning. Correct. Well, I can tell you, it is going to be stunning. But why is that an important uh, addition to campus? I mean, we all love the campus the way it is, but what does that bring that, that maybe we haven't had before, in your opinion? Well, I want to acknowledge, too, you know, Chuck Staben, who, who really was, was a catalyst for this, did a great job. But when I was talking to Chuck about this, and he was describing it, it's all going to be made out of... Uh, Idaho Forest Products, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I said, Chuck, is it stunning? And he said, well, what do you mean? I said, is it stunning? When anyone walks in that door, are they just going to go, oh, my word, what have you built? And I said, that should be our guide to anything we do. Um, and so why do we put it there? Well, because it's going to be for these wonderful men and women athletes at the University of Idaho. It's another venue right. where we can bring in others and they will all leave saying, well, I'll tell you what, that U of I, there are many stunning things there. And that's what, that I believe is one of the things that causes people when they first consider, should I go to the U of I? Do I wanna live there? Might I live in a dorm or a fraternity or sorority? If you have these elements, I think that's part of the attraction. I agree. I, um, as soon as we're going to get footage of that beam being placed, uh, Governor, I'm going to send it to you because it's, I love uh, it. it's really coming together. It's really coming together beautifully. Um, so you've been a mayor, a governor, a senator, a secretary of the interior, CEO. What's next for you? 
I don't know. Um, I'm currently serving on three publicly traded global boards, and I really enjoy that. I enjoy the boardroom. Um, I also serve on at least three boards that are philanthropic, where they do not pay you. Um, that too is enriching. Yes. For example, I recently joined the uh, World Center for Birds of Prey, the Peregrine Fund. Oh, interesting. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, uh, we used to take Heather and Jeff when they were youngsters, Patricia and I'd go out with Morley Nelson, Bill Burnham, and they'd show us these magnificent eagles, mm -hmm. mountains. Uh, we, we should be very proud of that. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. I'm looking over here and it looks like we have uh, some questions to right. the field. So let's jump. I don't want to, I could sit here and talk all afternoon, but I will let everybody else have a, a, a chance and ask a question too. So Christy, you want to jump into that for us? Sure. So uh, first question is, your title are, is, you have many titles, as Kathy just mentioned. Does anyone outside of your family call you Dirk? Oh, sure. Yeah, a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. But I am back, I'm back to governor. And people say, well, how is that? Yeah. I'll tell you why. It's, it's U.S. protocol. In the United States where the people are the boss, um, even though I was appointed by a president of the United States, confirmed by the U.S. Senate as secretary, um, but the boss are the citizens. So you go back to that title of governor where you were the CEO of the state. And then you don't want to tell Mike Crapo or Jim Rich this, but um, as the CEO, there's only one governor in the state and there's two senators. Mm -hmm. see? So, uh, but we're, we're really lucky to have a, a wonderful delegation serving and, and to have a fine governor, my buddy Brad there in the state house. Yeah. Good. And have you been asked to lend your expertise to the Trump administration in any particular committee or department? Yes. And I'll tell you what it was specifically. Okay. It was during the Gorsuch nomination to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And I think Neil Gorsuch is a fine jurist. I did get a call from the Trump White House Remember, this was early in the administration, but they said, we do not have an outreach. We don't have rapport at this point with Democrat senators. You served with them. They are still your friends. They respect you. Would you call Democrat senators on behalf of Neil Gorsuch? And I said, I absolutely will. And I'll be very honest with you. Every call was at least 20 minutes in length because the first few minutes were just friends reconnecting. Oh man, Dirk, it's so great to hear from you. Oh, John, I'm, I'm glad to hear from you, you know. And uh, Tom, how's Martha doing? Oh, terrific. Um, one of the senators told me, he said, Dirk, I'm really, I wanna make the right choice here. I'm, I'm reading the material, but it's, it's voluminous. But he said, I just lost my father-in-law and I love that man. We're a very tight family and I'm grieving. And I'll be honest with you, I have not been doing the homework. And I said, John, that's fully understandable. You are doing exactly what you should do as a caring man, but we elect people like you to practice family values. So properly take care of your family these few days. It will come back. You'll be back to this issue. And then I immediately called the White House and I, I said, would you please give to Mr. Trump this personal cell phone number? Because I think a call placed right now, simply saying, Senator, I understand that there's been a real loss of a loved one. We'll talk politics some other day, but right now, my friend, take care of the family. Mm -hmm. Bless you. Mm -hmm. So see, understanding how those things work though, and, you know, bringing that uh, element of humanity, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's just testimony to um, the skills that you've got, um, Governor. Mm -hmm. You had mentioned bipartisanship earlier, and um, 
Talk a little bit about your work um, as co-chair of the Democracy Project at the Bipartisan Policy, Policy Center. You know, it's a word that gets thrown around a lot these days. Mm -hmm. um, what was that like and what aspect of that work are you most proud of? Oh, let me, let me preface it perhaps by saying this. Um, I had two major pieces of legislation that passed Congress each of which were signed by Bill Clinton into law. Mm -hmm. And as you know, in the Senate, if you don't have 60 votes, nothing's moving. Right. Therefore, you have to be bipartisan. Right. If you want to do yep. you know, if you want to do the rhetoric, that's fine. But during that, you know, here I am, I'm a freshman, and I'm standing in the well of the Senate after some grueling, grueling days, weeks, of working the issue, debating it. But then on the final vote, I had many, many senior senators come by and say, Dirk, congratulations. It must feel great to have your name on something. And I thought, it does, but what have you been doing? <laughs> so that's why I, I say, if you're gonna get something done, you're gonna have to realize you better be able to um, have camaraderie and friendship and at least conversation with those of the other party because inevitably you will need each other someday so i mean it's it's that philosophy that i took to the bipartisan policy center i'm gonna tell you one other thing it's kind of interesting mm -hmm. one afternoon because when the republicans had the majority every tuesday afternoon i was the presiding officer of the u.s senate i was president of the senate wow and i remember one afternoon when the senator who was offering legislation was an outstanding senator, Larry Craig. Oh, and standing over in the back area was the United States Sergeant of Arms, Greg Casey. A vandal I mean, takeover. <laughs> here's three vandals. We're running the Senate right there. Yes. You yeah. know? So to all these wonderful graduates, and that's why I was really happy to handwrite 25 notes to 25 kids, um, you're getting an outstanding education that I think can prepare you for anything in the world if you um, have the right attitude, apply yourself, um, and, and, and want to make a difference. So that Bipartisan Policy Center, I would just probably wrap that by saying it was, here's this institution uh, former combatants, Republicans, Democrats, and now they get to do this because they're not combatants. Right. They try to come out with what they think is best for the country. Kind of a novel idea. <laughs> we should try it more often. Yeah, yeah you really should. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, what advice, you were talking about, you know, what a great education all of us as vandals. I mean, there's never been a day in my life where I didn't feel like my vandal education didn't prepare me for what I needed to do, right? So what advice do you have for current st uh, students who want to uh, go into public service? What are the things they should be doing? What are the things they should be thinking about? What are the things they should be studying? I'm going to expand it to all the students. Just remind every one of those students, whatever their degree is in, um, the U of I has prepared you to be successful. Those that are now thinking about possibly public service. And, and, and that's, here's a point. Um, because we're the University of Idaho, when I get a call that there's some, somebody affiliated with the University of Idaho that wants to meet, I meet. Mm -hmm. Maybe we call COVID. But for example, recently a, a friend of mine called and said there's this young man, he's an assistant professor, um, there at the University of Idaho, but he is a White House fellow. He's currently serving in the White House. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's a tremendous accomplishment and great honor. And he's wearing the U of I lapel pin, but Dakota Robertson wanted to talk to me about some of these things. And what an outstanding young man. His wife, Jenny, who's a NICU nurse, for the little infants. But I mean, to me, that, that's what this is about. This network that does exist out there. So 
to those that might be thinking of a public service, do it for the right reasons. If you are, if you do it right, you're not going to make a dime. <laughs> I mean, if you, you know, you're not. And uh, go into it for the right reasons. Go into it because you want to help others. I used to tell my staff, whether it was in the U.S. Senate, whether it was the City Hall, whether wherever it was, Interior, State House, it's five o'clock, six o'clock, seven o'clock on a Friday afternoon. Oh my word, we've been working so hard. And that phone rings again. Guess what? Answer it. Because you have another opportunity to be somebody's champion, reaching out into that bureaucracy and saying, I have a problem. Man, you get to be a champion. That's awesome. And also, never ever be a caretaker. Um, you're there to make a difference, a positive difference. Um, listen, listen well. I gave that I discussion about Kibbe Dome. That's where I learned it. You go to all the living groups. You lay out the game plan. Talk to me, folks. One time, as the U.S. Secretary of the Interior, I was the presiding officer at a public hearing in San Francisco. Okay. A thousand people jammed this auditorium. And they're going on and on. And I'm sitting there as the presiding officer. And I, they were going, you feds, you federals, you ba da ba da. And I, I started smiling. And this one fellow that was at the podium then said, what are you smiling about? And I said, it's no disrespect, sir. I happen to agree with you. <laughs> and I said, I left the United States Senate because I believe in states' rights. I believe in authority back closest to the people. Well, suddenly I was a pretty popular public hearing officer in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think you take all these different experiences, but that's what I'd say to these young people. I don't think there's a more rewarding um, career than to somehow be able to help other human beings in the variety of challenges of life, somebody that does have to make the rules. When I ran for the U.S. Senate and really was nobody, I mean, I was the mayor of Boise, but I had to go introduce myself to people. Right. When I was going out on Thursday afternoon and putting my bag into the trunk, it was no longer the ball bag as the coach mm -hmm. of either Heather or Jeff. It was my clothes to go campaign. Sure. I drive through Idaho on a Friday and it's when you still had Blockbuster, you'd rent the videos. Man, I'd see all the families. I wish I, I was home. Mm -hmm. But I thought somebody's somebody's got to make sure we can still have Little League and baseball and girls field hockey and all those things. I mean, so yeah, it's a wonderful thing, but it's not always easy. No, no, a lot of sacrifice involved in that kind of work. Yeah. Christine, let's do it. Make, make sure it's stunning. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> okay, let's. Um, this one's been asked a couple times. Um, hi, hi, Secretary. I met you once in 2007 in D.C. I worked for Bureau of Reclamation on your U.S.-Mexico priority. We're carrying on the great work you started. Bob Snow says hi, and my question is, what was your favorite thing you worked on at the Department of the Interior? And that question, that specific question at the end has been asked a couple times. What was your favorite project or what was the favorite thing you worked on? Yeah, at Interior? Yeah. Yeah. Um, they're so varied. I, I tell you, I remember, because I believe in education for youngsters, mm. uh, again, I was the trustee for all Native American tribes. And I remember putting at the different reservations uh, the third grade reading initiative so that all the kids could read. Uh, I remember going to Tuba City, uh, which is about a thousand kids there. And man, were they sharp. But it was, they all ran out to the fence. I mean, it was wonderful. Yeah. Um, Bureau of Reclamation and, and the things that we did there. My goodness. One time I flooded the Grand Canyon. Really? <laughs> <laughs> On purpose? Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the biologists had done this study. And because of Lake Mead and Lake Powell and all the dams, 
there was the, no longer the natural flow of the river so that you would have the natural sweeping of the uh, sediment at the bottom, mm -hmm. which would normally be replenished and you'd have your islands and your sandbars and back eddies. So anyway, they had done this study and they brought it to me and I read through it and uh, I agreed to it. So That's amazing. I just said, and I went to Glen Helen Dam and I said, don't give me some Hollywood button. I'm going to open this dam. And so they put me on this big grating that was over the opening, and I started turning the wheel. They, they calculated that the amount of water coming out was equal to the thrust of a Titan rocket. Wow. But we sent nine-foot waves down the Grand Canyon. Now, we had, the week prior, we had rangers everywhere, notices. Nobody was going to be in danger. What was the outcome? It worked. The flora and fauna that had not been there for decades came back. Wow. Um, uh, we, we did a lot of things. Um, the grit or the uh, polar bear was probably the toughest one. Mm. Uh, it was an issue I didn't, I did not initiate. I inherited that issue. Mm -hmm. um, it was made clear to me by advisors at the White House for many months that they wanted only one decision, and um, they pounded that into me. Mm -hmm. But I said to uh, Mark Myers, who was the head of U.S. Geologic Survey, what's your recommendation? He said, I don't know. And I said, what's well, a heck of a thing to tell me? He yeah. said, we've not done the study. I said, how long do you need? He said, 90 days. I said, get cracking. Mm -hmm. And then they brought back this, I don't know, it's 500 pages. I'm not a biological scientist. I'm a political scientist, but I read the darn thing. Mm -hmm. I had to read some of it two and three times. Remember, I did not do well in chemistry and physics. <laughs> um, but after reading it, I called the chief of staff of the president. I said, it's time for a decision. He said, I agree. He said, can you come over now? I said, yes. So I went over there. And um, he asked the deputy chief of staff to please leave. He shut the door. He said, I don't want any witnesses. I said, I agree. And I said, I know the decision you want. You've made it painfully clear. But I cannot and I will not give you that decision. I said, I did not resign as the governor of a sovereign state to come here and take the oath of office to serve this country, to serve this president, and have a bunch of people that haven't had real world experience tell me what the political decision should be. I won't do it but you have every right to have somebody in my post carry out that order if you wish. Mm -hmm. And he said, hang on, we're not gonna have another Saturday Night Massacre. Remember from Watergate. Oh yeah. He said, I have to take this to President of the United States tonight and you need to know that you may be fired and likely will in the morning. Mm -hmm. And I said, I fully understand. And I'll be honest with all of you, I slept well that night. Mm -hmm. You did the right thing. Had I caved in, knowing that in 48 hours I would walk to a podium with international media and read words that I did not believe, mm -hmm. I, I don't think I'd ever sleep again after that. So anyway, the next morning, the, this is the direct quote of the president. I'm inclined to agree with my advisors, but what is most important to me is the comfort of my secretary. Oh. So George W. Bush backed me 100%. And I listed it as threatened. You can't get around it. We're losing the sea ice, and I'll prove it to you. I've got it. But it's not, it wasn't on the endangered list. I put on the threat. And really, the issue's gone away. We had five major lawsuits. We won every one of them. So these are the things I think that I kind of learned back there in Moscow and the Palouse with good people, with good values. Yep. yep. Excellent. You know what? We have barely enough time, but we will take one more question. Governor, if you can give us just a moment or two more of your time. What have we got, Christy? Well, we have a few, so let me think. <laughs> um, no, um, somebody said, international, did you have any international travels that were especially memorable while in political office? And then someone wants to know how Jeff and Heather are doing. Oh, thanks. Uh, Jeff and Heather are doing terrific. Um, they're both outstanding parents and they married well. Um, we have the five grandkids that are just magnificent. So Brody, Jake, Cole, Remington, Dirk, 
and Evelyn, Virginia. Mm -hmm. So anyway, they're all the, these kids and the and the grandkids are doing great. great. Uh, yes, I had international travel. It's funny. I watched the movie Midway this week, mm -hmm. and uh, Midway is a annual celebration in Australia because had the U.S. not succeeded, Japan would have taken Australia. And so for the 65th commemoration of that event, President Bush asked me to go be the U.S. representative. So I flew there and delivered that speech. Mm. Also, um, because of that war in World War II, many of those islands uh, that were then taken as part of the success of the United States, the Navy transferred the administrative authority to the Department of the Interior. So I was administrative authority for much of the South Pacific, wow. Guam. Palau, Saipan, American Samoa. Uh, I am Pulele Iite, a chief in American Samoa. Wow. Um, there's this, I went to Midway Island, where you have the, uh, the, the aardvark. And Laura Bush was there, the first lady, gracious. And um, she loves all of the national parks, she and the president. Yeah. Uh, he created the largest marine sanctuary ever it's it's the same distance as from chicago to miami and it's called pulele iite no no that's my name it's called oh come on i'll take it again it'll come back to you it'll come back. <laughs> yeah papa hanao mokuakea wow perfect yeah yeah that's incredible our yeah. time together is over, sadly. What a wonderful, wonderful time. It went by really fast. <laughs> yeah, it went by really, really fast. And I just want to say thank you so much, Governor, yeah. for taking the time. Um, and uh, uh, any closing words for all of us? Yeah, thanks. Um, first of all, I think some of the best days of my life ever were at the University of Idaho. Mm -hmm. I mean that, and that's still true today. When I go back there, I go back with joy and affection in my heart. Um, I believe in the university. Um, we're gonna all be going through tough times, all of this virtual stuff. So to all the professors, the faculty, the staff, you're gonna all have to adapt to this brave new world. Um, I think that Scott Green is gonna do a tremendous job as the president of the university. I think that his background is going to lend itself you know, all of the finances, et cetera, to, to really uh, have that solid foundation for the university. And um, it, it has a, a wonderful future. And you have many alums that certainly believe in it. Um, Patricia and I were talking about what's the last thing you'd say to him. First of all, I have to say, uh, this is a nice cup. <laughs> to me by a buddy, Michael Bogert, yeah. alum. Anyway, I think he gave it to me. So um, <laughs> that way, I, see, I just got myself a cup. Yeah, you did. <laughs> so, but here's what I'd say. If the world would practice the golden rule, boy, we'd have a good world. Yes. I once had the opportunity to deliver that message to Pope Francis, um, wow. to a variety of religious leaders in different settings, part of that international travel. But um, anyway, the golden rule, and uh, they're in the golden palouse, and the silver and gold, I think we're gonna be fine. Yeah. I, can, I cannot do any better than that in closing. So yeah, thank you again you. so much, Governor. And to everyone on board, as always, thank you for being here, and go Vandals. Yes. Go Vandals.